Good morning, how are you? Um, I came from Chicago and we got snow last weekend. I didn't shovel it. Um, and uh, it's kind of nice to be here in Phoenix um, where they haven't worried about snow for quite a while. Um, so I hope you're enjoying that. I hope you enjoyed last night. Um, you all are very smart people because you made the right decision this morning. You're sitting in the session called Underlying Concepts in Seismic Design Codes, which is something I need to hear about for sure. Uh, but the reason I think that you picked the right session is you're sitting in the session given by Dr. Chao Ming Wang. And Dr. Wang, uh, while you made the correct decision today, he made the incorrect decision. He didn't tell me what to tell you about him, so I get to tell you what I know. And what I know is um, that when we develop seismic codes, which we've been working on now since Northridge and will continue to work on, uh, when Dr. Wong speaks, everybody listens. So you're hearing it from the best. Um, I have myself had the honor of working with Dr. Wong on two separate projects, uh, and we have a spy in our midst too, uh, Mr. Jim Newell is sitting in the audience, and Mr. Jim Newell worked on those projects also working for Dr. Wong. And um, there are differences in investigators, and when you work with Dr. Wong, you just get a fantastic project. Uh, in one of those projects, we sort of stumbled onto a problem in the way the test was set up, and uh, before I knew it, Dr. Wong had developed, and Jim had developed uh, the most articulate um, solution to the problem of how to use their SRMD device to get rid of a geometric difference in the test setup that we hadn't anticipated. Uh, <clears throat> very sophisticated, um, excellent solution. Uh, we've done two fabulous projects with Dr. Wong. And so, actually, I can tell you that <clears throat> when Mr. Melnick asked for some help with moderating uh, my choice uh, to come here and moderate this session was based on the fact that for me it's a great honor um, to be able to introduce Dr. Chao Ming Wong. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for um, uh, coming to uh, this morning's uh, session. Um, there, there was a session and there's another one or two this morning on the seismic design the one that uh, was offered by Professor Michael Ingle Hart uh, yesterday afternoon also talk about the seismic design, design codes. So I understand that it's also a very excellent uh, uh, presentation. My approach uh, is uh, slightly different, okay? I would like to focus more on the basic ideas, what, what our codes are doing, okay? Uh, in the past 20 years that we have, exp we have uh, seen a drastic, a very drastic changes in the seismic provisions. On the loading side, okay, let's take in the uniform building code, which has a strong influence for the rest of the country and um, or in the world before uh, we started using IBC. Uh, you know, we saw uh, a few major changes. We have been using the... Um, in 1985, UBC, we used the so-called uh, K factor. Okay, at that time, that we actually did not specify what is the earthquake ground motion. That formula is purely empirical. ADA was the, um, that addition was the first time that we move away from that empirical approach using the so-called K factor, and we start using the so-called uh, R factor. But it's for working stress design. So we use a so-called R sub W factor. That is the start that uh, our uh, US seismic codes start using this more rational, more transparent approach. I'm talking about the loading side of the, the seismic design. And uh, it wasn't until 97 we moved to R factor. Also in the meantime, okay, we have ASC7 and finally now IBC is uh, being adopted um, in the US. So we have the R factor, not to mention some other factors that goes with it, the CD factor, omega naught factors. Those, are, those factors are mysterious to some extent. Okay, so I would like to provide some background information. What the codes 
try to do. On the material side, the steel material kind of side, okay, again, in, uh, up to 1985, UBC, uh, the design, the seismic design of steel structures is relatively easy. Okay, it's very easy to design a steel a moment frame with, um, uh, with a moment connection. You don't have to do too much effort. You know, just put uh, some CJP here, there, and then that is done. Uh, not too much to check, and uh, you, know, you don't care too much how it was constructed. Okay, if we ever do testing in the lab, if something goes wrong, you know, that's the weirdest fault. It's our mentality, but life at that time was pretty, uh, was pretty uh, easy. It wasn't until ATA UBC that we started to introduce. That's a big step, historically, big step. In ATA, we started introducing the capacity-based design. For some of you who have been using those, um, um, that uh, 85 ATA code, we have the R sub W, we have a 3 eighth over R sub W. Those are, again, kind of a strange factors, you know. But basically, 85 to 85 is a double conversion from the so-called K factor to R sub W. Not too much mystery, even though the format is very, very different. But in, you move in the right direction, we are using more transparent way of, of uh, specifying the, the earthquake load. And um, that uh, R sub W approach, again, is for working stress design, the base shear that uh, was, spe was um, specified, okay, was used until 1994. Then came that uh, big uh, <laughs> North Ridge earthquake that turns the seismic design of steel structures upside down, upside down. We immediately rule out some common practice we have used for two or three, uh, two or three decades. In 97 UBC, if you want to design a special moment frame, <laughs> the building code does not tell you too much. It's your business. You figure out how to make it work. And um, five years after North Korea earthquake, okay, this was a very uh, huge effort, so-called the SAC, and um, I'm sure that most of you are aware of that, funded by FEMA. Okay, after five years of research, at the national level, you know, involved many engineers and the universities. Then they came up with some a set of uh, recommendations, but it's not called recommendations. So the so-called FEMA 350 and uh, and um, a few other uh, publications. Okay, because of this uh, North Korea earthquake experience and the SAC uh, document, uh, the FEMA document, okay, that strongly influenced the AIC seismic provisions. Currently, we have the 2005 edition. Okay, the 2010, okay, is, is in the, being embedded, and uh, it will be available very soon. But it's strongly influenced by, that the, FEMA three, uh, by the FEMA effort. As an engineer, we not only have to deal with the, the AIC seismic provisions, we also have to go to the, another document, AIC 358, because AIC 350 does not tell you what kind of connections are pre-qualified. Okay, we are burned by North Korea earthquake, so we are very, very conservative. And the purpose of the <coughs> pre-qualified connection document, okay, is, you know, to show you more precise, more specific way and what kind of connections that you can use. And the supplement will be released very soon that has a few um, more connections that will be available to the designer, including some bolted connection and even even one proprietary uh, bolted bracket moment connection that will be included in this um, supplement number one. On the wedding side, we also have uh, D, so called D1.8. Again, this one, D1.8, is purely because of the North Korea earthquake, because of the seismic consideration. So as a design engineer, you have to deal with a variety of documents. So in my presentation today, I will focus on the, the basic concept. OK, basic concept. And I'll explain why we are doing that and how we implement those concepts into the AIC session provisions. AIC has been uh, sponsoring sessions, for example, the sessions at the uh, NSCC or the seminars okay, throughout the country for many years. Okay, so those excellent uh, um, presentations usually are focused on showing design engineers very specific design details and of some popular, especially uh, some popular systems, step by step, 
and a very thorough way to describe um, how to use the AIC system provisions and the intent of it. In my presentation, I'm not doing that, okay, because, you know, that uh, has been covered by, by those, uh, by those uh, seminars, AIC seminars and so forth. Instead, after I introduce the basic concept, the most important concept, I will pick a few popular systems to demonstrate how those concepts are implemented. Okay, in the U.S. code, you know, for example, you look at the, um, the ASC 7, we like to use the term spatial. Okay, what's so special about it? We have a spatial moment frame, we have a spatial concentric frame. Okay, you look at, the, again, IBC or the ASC 7, we have the basic seismic load combinations. We have a spatial seismic load combinations. What's so special about it? <laughs> okay, and you know we have the earthquake load, we reduce by R. Okay, we reduce the load. And then in some document, uh, the, the AIC seismic provisions, it also uses another term, amplify seismic load. Well, the code wants us to reduce, then amplify. What a game we are playing. Okay, those are the things sometimes confuse people. And those are the, the things that, that I would like to, to present today. Of different kind of loads that we have to consider in, this, in, the, in either the basic or the spatial load combinations, Okay, this, the earthquake load is probably the one that is probably the most mysterious, especially that uh, for those of you who are, who are not in the high seismic regions, you know, who don't have to use, deal with the seismic issue all the time. Uh, that, that term is the, that the earthquake load, E, okay, is the one that um, is very confusing. We call the earthquake load, but we know in, in terms of the so-called equivalent lateral load design procedure, that the load actually is coming from the earthquake-induced inertial effect on structures. Okay, so we can help, before we talk about the detail thing, we have to can help to talk about the input. Input is ground motion. The in input ground motion varies widely, and it presents one of the largest uncertainty in earthquake um, response prediction. Okay, you, uh, many of you are familiar with this elastic so-called response path strong concept, and I understand that Professor Inglehart also talked about this yesterday. Okay, I will spend a very, very brief time, okay, in my presentation, there's no fancy formula. Okay, I try to explain in the simplest way that I can, I can think of. Just imagine you have a very simple structure, single degree of system, you know the mass, you know the, the, the lateral stiffness, so you know the period. Okay, so if you know the period, imagine this is a simple structure, you put it on the shaking table. Let's talk about the one earthquake record only. You shake it. Suppose this structure were to respond elastic. El elastic, of course, with the researchers doing the shaking table testing, we record thousands of test data. As a designer, which one do you care? The largest response is all you care. Because you want to see how much that member or the so-called spring is stretched because you want to find out the member force such that you can design for. So for that particular earthquake shaping table testing, okay, imagine that way, I know the period, then I find out the larger displacement, which we call the spectral displacement, then that is that point. And the from structure dynamics, we also know, if you do this conversion, you know, you know the maximum displacement from that earthquake shaking table testing, you do this conversion, then we will generate the so-called pseudo acceleration. Pseudo, not real. Pseudo. <laughs> okay. Pseudo acceleration, then, you know, um, then that, that point. Why pseudo, not real? Okay, again, I don't want to go going too, too much into the dynamics. The real, earth, the, the real acceleration actually produces inertial force. And in the model that we use, mathematical, mo mathematical model we use, that inertial force actually is resisted by so-called damping force and the restoring force. We don't care about damping. Then we help us. All we care is the restoring force, okay? And if you use this term, it happens, if you multiply by the mass, mass times this pseudo acceleration, it happens to give you the spring force. That's what we care. Okay, we're designing member. Okay, there's a base shear. So, okay, so we have this value. We call the sp spectral acceleration, okay, which is the pseudo acceleration. If you make the, 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 the structure, keep the mass, and make it longer, the, 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 the period will change. You do another test, 
Then you get a lot of pain. You just keep on repeating the testing. You get this curve. This is a displacement response spectrum. Okay, very simple concept. Okay, and to this conversion, you get pseudo acceleration response spectrum. The seismic code usually does not give the earthquake ground motion. Instead, it specifies the ground motion in terms of elastic response spectra to start with. Elastic. Elastic. So this is from ASC7. You can see this is the um, one okay, that has been uh, used. In the latest uh, ASC7, they use, in the old days, we used the so-called 475-year return period to specify the design earthquake. But the recent trend is to move up to 2,500-year return period. So we have to multiply by two-thirds to scale it down to that so-called design basis earthquake. Okay, but this is a form to specify the earthquake ground motion. Okay, in other words, if you know the, the structure of, uh, you, if you know structure period, you just enter there, you find the spectral acceleration, you test mass. Okay, or whenever this is mo normalized by G, you multiply by weight, then you know what is the maximum base shear that you need to design for your structures. Coming back to this one, in high seismic regions, in high seismic regions, okay, for example, like this level, it is not uncommon that the level is on order of 1G, 1G. So you just imagine if you have a building that is in that period range, then you design your structure for 1G. If you don't want to count on ductility, and this is 1G building, right? You put your building horizontally, this is 1G, and we know the buildings we design, if you put it horizontal, you build it horizontally from the cliff. It'll collapse. It'll collapse. Okay, now we realize we cannot design structure to remain elastically because earthquake force is too strong. Okay, so the way we do, okay, the, the pioneers in earthquake um, engineering, they observe from past earthquake, they realize actually the structure do not collapse even if you don't design for that very, very high, say, 1G earthquake load because there's some inherent ductility to it. So the seismic code has been relying on ductility. In other words, we want to trade the ductility for strength. Okay, you want to design for low strength for economical reasons, then you need to provide ductility. So strength and ductility go together, go together. Coming back to this uh, elastic system, okay, I mentioned to you, you know, just imagine that you have an earthquake, you put on the shaking table, you shake it, and uh, I know the structure, it is a single degree of freedom system, I know the structure, uh, period, so I know the acceleration, pseudo acceleration. When I multiply by that, that, that by the weight, okay, when it's normalized by G, multiply by weight, I know the elastic force. And also from the, the displacement response spectra, I also know how far it will go. So this is the elastic system. If you don't do anything, okay, you don't count on ductility, you know which is not economical at all. Okay, now if we reduce, if we reduce this, okay, this force, to a much smaller level, okay, this one we call the ductile reduction factor, ductile reduction factor, which is depending on, which is depend on what kind of ductility you are willing to provide to the structure, okay, it's not cheap, you want to provide ductility, to build in the ductility into the system, okay, so if you provide ductility into it, okay, then you can benefit from that reduction. In the 70s, okay, this is one of the, uh, probably the most famous, uh, uh, rule proposed by Newmark and Hall in the 70s. Okay, he observed from doing some nonlinear time history analysis, they claim, they claim, as long as the period of structure is not too short, you put one elastic system on the shaking table, or you, or at also at the meantime, if you put another structure with a much lower year force, you let it yield. Okay, you imagine you have two structures, one will remain elastic, very strong, the other one will yield, even though they have the same period, they have the same stiffness, initial stiffness. You shake it, the maximum displacement is about the same. Okay, he also talked about what if the period is not too short, but I'm using this to, illust to illustrate. Okay, he's noticed that, you know, 
for the elastic system, the model one that will remain elastic, it will go to this displacement. For the other one that is weaker, okay, it will yield at that level, but then it will deform. That means you have to provide ductility, otherwise it will break. Okay? If it is, has the ability to, to, to stretch, then actually the deformation, the maximum deformation is about the same. This is so-called, this is the so-called equal displacement rule that proposed by them. If you consider this small triangle, okay, keep in mind, so-called the ductility factor is defined as the ratio between the maximum displacement to the ear displacement, okay? The ratio between these two is called the ductility. And because of the, uh, the similarity between this small triangle and the large tri triangle, you can figure that out easily. This allowable reduction factor, according to this equal displacement rule, actually, sorry, I, this is a mistake, okay? R mu is equal to mu. In other words, if you provide ductility 4, then you can reduce your force by a factor of 4. Okay, this is a typo there. It should be R mu equal to mu. Okay, and that's the ductile reduction factor. So that's very encouraging. You know, if you are willing to put the effort, put the money, you know, and the, to make the ductility uh, built into the system, then you can benefit from that. Otherwise, you cannot. So here comes the most important concept, the most important concept underlying the seismic delay codes. We are we are relying on ductility. The item one here shows, okay, you can use to reduce the seismic force only if you provide sufficient ductility. Sufficient. <coughs> sufficient. Okay, when it comes to the actual implementation, how to quantify ductility is, is, is hard. Because now we're talking about deformation. Okay, one major difference between the seismic design and the non-seismic design, for non-seismic design, usually we, work, we focus on force. But for seismic design, when it comes to ductility, we focus on deformation. And deformation capacity is much more difficult to predict, not to mention when it is under cyclic loading. Under cyclic loading. Even though we said ductility is very, very important in seismic codes, we don't put the ductility everywhere. This is a very, very important concept. We don't do that. Instead, instead, we strategic, strategically put the, the structural fields that are allowed to yield and to dissipate energy in certain locations. And those structural fuses, those structural fuses in some document is called Okay. In the, in the ASC41 document, it's called the deformation controlled elements. ASC41 is seismic uh, uh, design guideline for retrofit. Deformation controlled elements. So in my presentation, I will use deformation controlled element and the structure fields interchangeably. Okay, so deformation controlled element means, means the members that are designed to deform beyond yield. Okay, there's a structure fuse. So this is very, very critical. We are... Uh, um, we know where those uh, structure fields are located. Of course, they are different. And the, the structure fields that we use for different kinds of systems are also different. Let me give you one example. And I will elaborate more later on. Concentric brace frame. How do we want the structure to, to, to behave? Okay, in this particular system, usually, for example, like the so-called spatial concentric brace frame, we want the diagonal braces to serve as structure fields. In other words, we expect, we expect those members will yield, will buckle and yield. That's it. But every other part of the structure, every other part of the structure should not yield. Okay, this is the ductility concept, okay? Again, the structure fields is not everywhere. It's only at a certain location. Okay, so using this one example, now we know that we want the brace to buckle and yield. Okay, usually they buckle first. Then how, how do we want it to buckle? Okay, we know it can buckle in plan or out of plan. Code allows you to do either way. Either way, but engineers find it easier to let it buckle out of plan. So we have to put the effort to make sure it buckles that way. In other words, we don't bet on luck. Okay, let it be, you know, we don't do that. 
Okay, for non-seismic, you check the in-plane buckling, out-of-plane buckling, then you use the governing one to determine your capacity, but not in this business, okay? You first decide what you want. Okay, we don't do seismic design blindly. So if you want to want, want the brace to buckle out of plan, then you need to detail that way to make it happen. Okay, in other words, to achieve this, what do we want? Okay, more effort is needed to make it happen. So we have a specific goal. To make it happen then comes to the second most important concept in seismic design, so-called capacity design. This capacity design, this term has a special meaning for seismic design. It has a special meaning. Okay, we only use that. It's not strength design. Okay, don't mix that capacity design with strength design or ultimate strength design. It's not. Capacity design has a special meaning for seismic design. That means, that means once we have decided we want these bra braces to be the structure fuse. We want the beam, the columns, and also the connections. The welded, bolted joint, the gusset. We want to make sure they will remain elastic. They will remain elastic. They are strong enough. They are strong enough means now we're not talking about ductility. We're talking about strength. We're talking about strength. For those elements, they are not supposed to, to yield. Okay, we call those elements as force control element. That is the term used in ASC 47. So we have deformation control element, that is structure fields, okay, and the force controlled element. Okay, that is the one that is uh, the, uh, the remaining part of the structure. They go together. They two go, to go together. So with these two concepts concept in mind, okay, now let's look at the ASC system provisions. Okay, system provisions, you know, when you read it, sound, it looks like very complicated, but actually, I will use these two concepts, okay, to dissect this uh, document, to see what we are doing, okay. In other words, you will see that uh, this document is centered around these two. If you know these two concepts, reading it is much easier, and then you have a less chance to misuse it, to misuse it. Now I emphasize ductility design and the capacity design. Which one, is, which one is more important? And what do you think? Our design provisions has more requirement for ductility or for capacity design? What do you think? Ductility, is that right? I will show you opposite. I will show you opposite. Okay. The ductility design, ductility design, okay, is for deformation control elements, structure fuse. Okay, structure fuse. You want it to deform. Deformation capacity beyond is the most important thing. Then the remaining part of structure, we do capacity design. Those are the so-called force control element. Okay, two groups. Every member you can classify into one of the two. If you know which group it is, then your life will be easy. Okay, you will not get lost in the jungle of the seismic uh, provisions in the 350. You will not, you will not get lost in the, in the jungle. Now let's I put, a, I put this matrix, look at the research effort. For the past few decades, we do lots of research because we, because we want to know the deformation capacity and the secondary loading. So analytical tool is limited. So this reason why we have to do lots of testing, lots of testing. Most of this te testing actually aims to, to deal with this. What is the deformation capacity? Actually, our research effort, don't put too much effort on this, because this is a force control element. We only count on strength. Let's just go to the ASC, size, ASC specification. ASC specification does not talk about ductility, not too much about ductility. Okay, the compact section or whatever it is, but not that type of ductility we're talking about. So most of our research effort focus on this. Okay, then the, the, then the seismic committees, the ASC seismic or building, building code committees, they digest the research findings, then they write into code. Or they write in code based on those findings. So in the ASC uh, 350 seismic provisions, you will see the provisions. Actually, in my view, the hard part is done by researchers. And the, 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 the design requirement, detail requirement are spelled out explicitly. So you, the designer, you just go and follow. For example, okay, I will show you more example. You just follow it. It's relatively easy. 
You don't have to think too much. Just, just do it. <laughs> follow, the, follow the requirement. The hard part is here. Okay? Yeah, you, some of you previous thought that the, you know, the assessment provisions focus more on this. Hard part, I have a different view. Hard part is here. This required an, an understanding what you are doing. The member you are designing is the first control element or deformation control, uh, is a, or deformation control element. You need to know that first. Okay? Once you know that, you, then you will know what the language, what is the spatial or basic seismic load combinations, what is the amplified seismic load mentioned in the seismic code. So this one requires good understanding, especially requires you to have a good understanding of the underlying concept, what the codes are really doing. And you also ex need to exercise judgment as to how to apply it. Code is not very clear, even though the AIC seismic seminars, you know, they have been, ha they have been giving throughout the years, have been putting lots of effort by experienced engineers uh, like um, uh, Mr. Saberi, you know, he has provided lots of uh, guidelines as to how you implement it, even though the code does not tell us very well what to do. You cannot read this, okay? You cannot read this. I just picked three pages from the special concentric brace frame provisions, okay? You look at AS and provisions, there are three pages. I try hard to locate where are the ductility requirements, the yellow portion. The other portion are capacity design requirement. <laughs> okay? And you can do the other thing. You can look at other, other provisions. A significant amount of effort actually is devoted to the capacity design, not necessarily ductility design. Okay, so this is a one, one example. The ASC seismic provisions, okay, is um, outlined from chapter 9 until chapter 17, there are a variety of systems, different kind of moment frames, and uh, trust, spatial trust, and different kind of uh, spatial and ordinary concentric brace frame, essential brace frame, buckling strength frame, and the spatial pressure walls. Okay, as I mentioned that uh, the, 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 the ASC seminars has been picking some particular topics, picking particular topics, and going detail as to how to apply each particular system, operative system, okay? And the, the code is also written in the sequential manner, sequential manner, okay? In, seri in, 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 the, in, in series. The presentation to follow, okay, I will base on those two concepts. I will do the other way. I would walk in the other direction. I walk in parallel, okay, not in, in, the, in this way. I walk in this way to see how the ductility cap capacity design is done. In this system, this system, this system, this system. Okay, again, I'm emphasizing the concept. Similarly, I will, I will pick a few systems in parallel, then I will demonstrate how the capacity design is done. Okay, so I'm doing the, in the transverse way, not the longitudinal way, to, um, to highlight the seismic design provisions. So let's first start with the ductility design. I pick three most popular systems. One is moment frame, one is concentric brace frame, one is a, one is a special concentric brace frame, one is eccentric brace frame. Okay, based on the concept that we have, we want to select structural fuses. So I use the red line to show where are those structural fuses. We designate those to be the structural fuse. We want them to yield. Okay, during the earthquake, moment frame, we want the beam to yield. Okay, we want the beam to yield. And uh, the, the second row, you can see, okay, under the earthquake load, we want the beam to yield such that the so-called fracture press hinge will form at the ends of the beam to dissipate the energy. For the middle one, the spatial concentric brace frame, we change our strategy. Let's change our strategy. In this case, the red line is in the braces. Okay, I realize I made a mistake. In the, the second one, the, the, the concentric brace are the red line, it means they are the structural fuses. Okay, and uh, during the earthquake, during the earthquake, we want the brace, we expect the brace to, to buckle, and we also expect the tensile brace to yield. Okay, so that is the second uh, scheme. 
For the last one, I made a mistake. This should be the bracket line because we want this short segment of the beam, which we call it link. We want the link to yield in shear. To yield in shear. So, the, actually, this segment should be red, which rep represent the pressure <coughs> fields, and these two should be black. So you can see, we have the braces, we have the braces here, we have braces here, but their design philosophy are very, very different. Here, the brace are treated as deformation controlled element. Okay, we need ductility. But here, no, we are counting on strength. Instead, we want ductility to be in the link. Okay, and this is the so-called desired yield mechanism. So every system, okay, in the mind of the called uh, developer, they know what is the target yield mechanism they are looking for, and the design provisions are written around this concept. Okay, so I will give you three examples. Okay, let's use the example one. Example one is a special moment frame. Okay, so I'm talking about capacity. I'm talking about the ductility design. Now, okay, I'll give you a few examples to see how we actually implement it. A variety of connections are available. The one to the left is the it's a bolted fringe. Okay, a bolted fringe, more connection that will be included in the supplement number one of the of the CPRB um, uh, 358 very soon. Okay, there's a bolted version if you ever want to do it. Okay, another one, the cover plate is not very common. Uh, it's not commonly used nowadays, but it was popular in a few years immediately after the North earthquake. The third one, okay, is the is a weighted hunch. And uh, Mr. Jim Mary will give a presentation on one of the retrofit projects his, his firm is working on, and we did some testing. And then this is the specimen we tested. All, the, the, all these ideas, the more connection idea, okay, that uh, here, among other things, including some propriety connections, their aim, their goal is the same. They want the press hinge to form in the beam, not in the weighted joint. Not in the weighted joint. Okay, this is the only one which is currently pre-qualified for high seismic uh, application, uh, high seismic uh, re applications. It's a reduced beam section, okay? And I'm sure that many of you are very familiar, familiar with this. We do the opposite way. Other than strengthen it, we weaken it, okay? At first glance, if you're not familiar with the seismic design, you say, that's odd. You know, how come you're making my beam weaker? And you say it's better uh, because a variety of reasons, okay? We are looking for tactility. We are looking for tactility, and for, it happens for this particular system, special moment frame, usually the drift governs. Okay, not strength. That's the reason why, because of that, we have enough fat in the system we can trim, okay, in order to promote the press hinge to form in the beam, to be consistent with the, our target yield mechanism. Okay, what do we like to see? Here, there's a very short video. Let me see. Okay, this is the RBS moment connection that we did. Uh, it's a 36 beam. How do I make it? Okay. It's so called press hinging. Okay, you can see the web buckling. You see the beam and the French local buckling. Okay, this is the type of this is the type of press hinging that we are looking for. Okay, so we have to put a special effort to make sure it happens that way. It happens that way. Okay, so this is the one. Uh, before I go next, okay, let me see. What we don't want to see is this, the so-called pre north moment connection. Here I will just show a very, sh again, another very short video. Okay, here what you see is the specimen that we tested, the BBW30 by 99 and that with W14 column. Okay, we take a half span of the beam, in assuming the inflection point is at the mid-span, 
we then load it at the end of the beam. The way this joint, the beam counter joint, was, was the so-called pre-Northridge style. Okay, we want, our intent was to have the press hinge form in the beam. Okay, now let's see. Look at the connection. Do you see press? Do you see press hinge? No. Okay, we, we don't see even single press hinge that was developed during the earthquake. It's very embarrassing. Okay, very embarrassing. Okay, because there's a way to join for in the category of capacity design. We want to make sure they are strong enough. Okay, that allows the beam to hinge, but we don't see it. Okay, so going back to To the one, okay, the previous one that I show you, the RBS, okay, usually will produce this kind of hysteresis behavior, okay. And from this hysteresis behavior, you can, feel, you can observe a few things. It reaches the maximum, it reaches the maximum uh, strength, uh, the, 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 the strength of, the, of the beam, then it starts to degrade. Of course, when we talk about ductility, we want to make sure the strength does not degrade too fast. So we have to put effort to make sure it does not degrade too fast, okay, and to get the ductility that uh, we want. Okay, so we have to do a few things. Now we're talking about ductility now, okay. How do you make that structure fuse work? For local buckling here is the local buckling. You can see that, uh, you know, um, from, from the video and from here you can see that uh, for this RBS we have the web, usually web local buckling will occur first which is followed by French buckling. You course, from this slide, you can see some of the limited yielding in the panel zone, okay? And uh, another, another phenomenon that will cause a rapid strength degradation is the lateral torsional buck. Uh, no, this is the local buckling, okay? This is the local buckling. So, AIC, seismic provisions, provide a table, okay? That, that to ensure ductility, Okay, that does not degrade too, too fast. You want to make sure the beam sections are seismically compact. So this is a requirement for ductility. Okay, it's not for capacity design, it's for ductility. There's one for the French, for the unstiffened element, and there's another one for the stiffened element. Similarly, lateral torsion buckling may occur, which will also cause um, uh, strength degradation. So this is one example you can see that uh, the beam has a tendency to to buckle laterally. Okay, so ASC provides us the maximum braced length. This is the ductility requirement. Okay, in order to ensure the press change will form. Will form. Penazol has been shown to be actually very ductile. Okay, it can deform a lot. Okay, you can also see from the um, you know, here you can see a lot, but because of the concern of the kinking at the dislocation where the glue is located, so the current practice is to limit the panel zone deformation to about four times of the shear year strength. So there's a lengthy formula for the panel zone strength, actually allows some limited yielding. So strictly speaking, the ductility that we want the steel mount frame to see is mainly in the beam, but it's okay to have some limited yielding in the panel zone, which is inherently buried in the panel zone strength calculation. Okay, but that, that for the in case, but in case uh, for the panel zone, okay, no matter you have a double plate or not, there's another requirement. Okay, that um, want to make sure that uh, the buckling of the of the panel zone uh, will not occur in one of the testing that we did for. Uh, Jimmy for retrofit, you know, they, they had a very thin double plate, and during the testing, it buckled. It buckled in shear. Yeah, and this formula is intended to avoid that kind of the, uh, buckling in the panel zone. So those are the, uh, you know, local buckling, lateral torsional buckling, and you look through the ASC, 
uh, set of provisions, and I found another place. I classify that as the as the ductility requirement. It's so-called protected zone. Protected zone is specified in every systems. Here, this is the RBS. RBS, you can see there. This RBS, based on the video I show you, if it worked, it worked very hard. The strain, okay, it will, the, the strain will way go beyond the ear strain. And you don't want to mess around in that area. Okay, like uh, attaching some, um, some angle there or miscellaneous thing. And this is the even worse case. Just look at this one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> happens all the time. <laughs> And I call um, uh, the, the chair of the assessment committee, Mr. Mary. I said, what to do? You know? <laughs> I've been receiving a few phone calls from engineers. And then I also noticed that whenever they have this kind of problem with a shot pin, you know, shooting into the protected zone, then they have to come up with some repair scheme. And looking at those repair scheme, I'm afraid it may do more harm <laughs> than, you know, but again, there's no guideline as to what to do. This is a practical problem, even though effort has been made to try to paint that area, try to mess around that region during the construction, but it happens. It happens. Okay, now let's go to the second system, let's, the second example to demonstrate the ductility concept, okay, that is, uh, that is implemented in the seismic provisions. Okay, here, there are different uh, configurations. Okay, there's two photos that I took in the uh, in the, San in the San Diego region. Those are the spatial constraint brace frame. Okay, we want this. So the fuse is in the braces. And uh, this is the specimen. Okay, that's what done by Professor Sai from Taiwan. It's a three-story frame, I believe. Okay, you can see, based on our current design philosophy, this is what we like to see. Okay, and it's detailed that way. It will buckle. It will buckle, and uh, such that a press hinge will form in the middle. By that end, we also want the gusset to be flexible enough, okay, to go with the right for the brace to pop out the plan. Okay, this is the what we aim for, to aim for. Okay, so we have to detail in the way to make it happen. Talking about the brace itself. Okay, the ASC seismic provisions in section 13.2a has a requirement. Okay, this requirement, I show you three pages. This is one of them. Okay, limiting the KL of R. Okay, and the maximum value for non-seismic, preferably is 200. For seismic applications, we reduce it. So there's one requ requirement there. Okay, when it's too long, then you know that um, um, it's not very desirable from the energy dissipation point of view. The brace itself, if you look at the actual deformation versus actual or force, um, you look at the testing, you can see once it reaches the compression, once it reaches buckling, the strength will degrade drastically. And in a subsequent cycle, it will never climb to the original buckling load. The buckling load will, will be much lower than the initial buckling load, so-called P sub N, okay, if you compute based on ASS testing provisions. Okay, in addition to that K of R limit for global buckling, we also have to worry about local buckling. Local buckling, and uh, it has to be, the sections for the, for the braces has to be seismic compact. Okay, there are some requirements, for example, if you use HSS, okay, the limiting B over T ratio are there. Again, this is the testing from a professor Sai in Taiwan. You can see initially, Okay, because that press hinge will form at the mid-span of the beam. Okay, but after a few cycles, because of the high curvature at the corner, usually the HSS section is cold formed. So the ductility is very limited at corners, even though the strength is higher. But, it's a, but ductility is very limited. So after a few cycles, it will start to tear. Okay, if the B over T is too big, the fracture will occur in very early. So we want to delay, delay this kind of fracture. That's the reason why the AIC seismic provisions has a table that require uh, that the, the structure fuse, which is a brace, to satisfy those requirements. So that again, that is part of the ductility requirement. 
to flex out the plan, okay, in the main body of the spec does not tell you, but if you look at the commentary, yeah, so-called minimum, so-called two T requirement again, that falls into the category of ductility requirement, okay, even though it's in the commentary. And here you can see, okay, yeah, I may already have mentioned that to you that you want the, the gusset to flex out the plan to behave like a hinge, like a hinge. <coughs> okay, look at this detail. Okay, you can see that based on that requirement, this brace cannot go beyond too much into this line from the corner, draw a line, which perpendicular to a brace. You want to leave the gap at least 2T. You don't want it to, to go beyond that. Okay, such that the plate can bend, can bend. How about this one? This is not, this does not satisfy the 2T requirement. Who knows what, what will happen once the brace buckles? You know, who knows? Only Mother Nature will tell us how it will behave. Okay, so this is not the ductility term, but this is. More examples. Okay, this again, this is the, some construction on our campus. You can see that the gusset under the 2T, the brace cannot go too detailed at the base. The base, same thing. Okay, same thing. Try to avoid that. This 2T requirement has been there, but uh, in the past, uh, I would say at least five years, a second amount of research has been uh, done to deal with this issue with a, with a, with a special consensus frame um, as the main, uh, main thing. Okay, uh, Professor Reuter, uh, who is with us here, he will also give uh, his presentation uh, twice, I believe, to talk about his research, and uh, he has a different view. Probably we don't need 2T. Okay, and um, yeah, I'm sure that uh, his uh, research finding will be of interest to you. But they all fall in the category of this uh, so-called ductility in order to accommodate the intent, intended uh, the target yield mechanism to occur. Okay, this is another building on our campus. You can see this much more complicated. But again, the 2T requirement is clearly shown. Okay, that is the current practice. Okay, as documented, explained in the 2005 AIC assessment provisions. The commentary also comments something regarding this one, you know, the, this satisfied 2T, but after you put a concrete slab, it's gone. Okay, so AIC, the commentary also mentions some you know, measure, for example, you should put some soft material you know, next to the gusset to let it flex. Otherwise, your good intent to let it flex will be gone once the concrete slab is cast. Okay, this is the second example. The last example is the essential brace frame. Okay, essential brace frame. It's also used, okay, and also used uh, from time to time. Okay, here you show two examples. And uh, the configurations, okay, there are two different kinds of con con configurations. But uh, this configuration is troublesome. Okay, if you read the carefully of the, of the, the commentary of AIC system provisions, why? Because this is the moment connection, similar to the special moment frame. In addition to that, it has a tremendous high shear. It's tremendous high shear. So this has been an unresolved issue, even though the ASC has sponsored some research with some limited success. But the no pre-qualified connection for this is available at the moment. So the advice is do this such that you avoid the link to column moment connection. Okay, so this is the one. And in this, in this, uh, in this system, this is the fuse, okay? That is the fuse. So we want ductility. We want ductility. The EBF system is probably the only system that I'm aware of that has, I call it, the best deformation check. 
probably the only one that has explicit deformation check, explicit one. For other system, for example, like special moment frame, or the, 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 the uh, uh, special constraint moment frame, we never have the provision to check deformation capacity. But with the, with the EBF, yes, we do have. If we, once we use the, follow the typical design procedure using the CD factor and so on to compute the design storage drift, okay? Design storage drift, because the system initially is very stiff. So you can roughly assume that the design storage drift is the same as so-called the plastic component. And the, from a simple geometry and the consider this plastic ear the mechanism that we can derive this, this is the angle. Do you see that the link has to experience a very large rotation angle? It's so-called inelastic in rotation angle that we call the gamma. And the from simple geometry of the span and the height, this formula is given in the commentary of the AIC sensible provisions, and you can derive by yourself. That's very easy derivation. So the reason why I said this is the best, this is the best system is the system that has the best uh, uh, deformation check is design engineers will check this. Okay, this represents the deformation demand. Deformation demand. And this is the only system we check deformation de demand against the deformation capacity and we have that information in the code but not other system. Not other this system. Okay. This link deformation capacity depends on a few things. The compact, compactness, or compactness. Okay, for example, the web you have to it has to be seismic compact, based on the research sponsored by AISC. Okay, and uh, the compactness is, compactness for the French has been relaxed in the 2005 AISC seismic provisions, because it is the web that is the most important part. Once you stiffen properly, the web is the one that is used to dissipate the energy. Okay, so there's a compactness system, a compactness requirement that has, is needed. The length of the link plays a very crucial role. And we need to stiffen it in order to avoid early buckling. Okay, here, there are two examples. Here, there is, there are, this curve shows the link length. Okay, as I said in this presentation, I'm not going to detail to the design provisions. I just give you the concept. But in the provisions, you will see the 1.6 MPV divided by VP and the 2.6 MPV. And if you know, because if you know the section, then you know this value, you know this value, then you know which zone you are in. Once you know which zone you are in, then code tells you if you are in this zone, which means your link is short, then it will yield in shear and code will say, if you do this, you will get 0.08 radian in elastic rotation. Okay, this is the only system that has this explicit information. Okay, if the link is too long, it's just, 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 like, the, just like a moment frame, you know, then the pressure forms at the end, then you only have 0.02 radian. Okay, that is a link. This is a link capacity. Okay, this is very, very unique. Unique system. To develop the cap capacity, you need stiffeners because it's for short, short link. You need to stiffen just like plate girder design. You need to put intermediate web stiffeners to stabilize the web. Okay, and the code also tell you, you know, if the beam is not too deep, you can put a stiffener on one side, otherwise you put two, two, two sides, but not, not, not big deal. You just follow the code, and then you can, you can do this uh, uh, bacterial design for the link. Okay, so this is the, the bacterial requirement. One example, okay, I mentioned to you I mentioned to you that uh, in the North Ridge earthquake, we don't see, as, as far as I know, I have not seen a single press hinge form in the real building. Okay, but in 2001, uh, in the Seattle area, this, uh, you know, there was an earthquake. Okay, this particular building, which apparently was retrofitted with eccentric brace frame. Retrofitted with eccentric brace frame. Okay, and uh, my former colleague, Professor Philip Trout, was able to sneak in and took some photo. And you can see the link there. Okay, now let's see the next one. The owner may not like it. You know, how come the, the pen flaked? We the engineers were very happy. The fuse works. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, okay. That's an EPF. Okay. 
together with the, those kind of things, uh, those, um, um, you know, uh, tactical requirements uh, that I mentioned, lateral bracing is also very important, okay? I classify that into the tactility design aspect, category. Okay, you can see that the link, okay, and this is another building on our campus, okay? You can see the link, and you can see the lateral bracing, okay? In order to stabilize the link, the sensing provisions provide all very detailed information, how much, what is the required strength, stiffness, and so on to design lateral bracing, which I am not going to detail, but it's there, okay? It's very straightforward if you want to do it. There are other systems, okay, and uh, I will not go one after the other, but the concept is the same. So when you read any one of the systems, first thing you want to know is, before you read the provisions, the first thing you need to know is, you want to know who is the structure fuse. Once you know that, then reading that part of the section, the life will be much easier. Now go to the second part, okay? Capacity design, second part. They go hand in hand, go hand in hand. Okay, as I, as I mentioned to you, I claim the seismic provisions has more provisions for capacity design than tactility design. Okay, in order to make the system work. Okay, this is the one that I mentioned to you. I mentioned to you earlier. Okay, from the design point of view, this is easy, straightforward, but capacity design, it requires judgment and understanding. Understanding. To talk about the capacity design, we unavoidably have to deal with these three so-called mysterious factors, R factors, CD factors, omega naught. And I will take this opportunity to explain to you the physical meaning of it, okay? This one I showed you earlier, the new mark on the hole, ductile reduction, ductile, ductile reduction law. Very, very famous. And you can find hundreds of papers following their uh, idea, you know, to fine tune. But the basic concept is about is about right. Okay, that's the reason why I like the simplicity of it. R mu is equal to mu. Okay, this is the typo as I mentioned to you earlier. When you mark and the whole they come up with this rule, they assume this is the bilinear system. Okay, so mathematically it's very, very easy to model. But in real world, when you extrapolate that simple single degree system to multi-story system, problem arises. Arises, okay? That's, that's some headaches. Imagine, you design, based on the current practice, you design three-story steel building, and you put it in our lab, and let's load it. Let's say we, the literal load pattern, follow the IBC, okay? And we push monotonically, just like a push-over testing, push-over push over, push over analysis, we keep on push monotonically, and then, we plot the response. Okay, the vertical axis represents the base shear and the horizontal axis represents the drift, which may be roof drift or some critical interstory drift. If you push, okay, we know at one location, which is the most critical stress, we start to form press hinge. This is the moment frame, so we want hinge to fall in the pin. So it's there. Okay, the important thing I want to mention is before this occurs, this is linear elastic, linear elastic. Why do I want to mention this? Because from the origin to the point S, it's elastic, that means the software that you use routinely in design office works, okay? You, okay, so it works. Your, your structure analysis software can most, most often, okay, can deal with elastic analysis, <coughs> this one. By the way, I forgot to mention to you what is E. E is the design based earthquake, because you know the period of the building, you follow the, uh, the, the, the IBC, you know what is the base shear, when R equal to one, before you reduce the earthquake load, so this is E, okay? But when you push it, it will E at the very early stage there, if you keep on pushing, you see more hinges, and the push more, okay, you get more, okay, and eventually the structure will reach the peak and start to degrade, okay? We we'll start to degrade, that's because of buckling, or especially when you have a gravity load. Of course, we always have a gravity load. The so-called P data effect will make it to, 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 um, to degrade in strength. Okay, same curve, same curve. I mentioned to you E is the design-based earthquake. If you want to design your building to remain elastic, this is the, how high the force needs to be. 
okay? And from, the, from that testing, I mentioned to you what is the S. S is the location where the first pinch will form. So you do your elastic structure analysis because this is linear, okay? We like linear analysis. We don't, we don't like plastic analysis. We don't like nonlinear analysis, okay? So that is the reality. But up to that, you can compute what is the story drift. Now, with this real response, okay, let's idealize that, just like a new mark. Now I have a bilinear system. Bilinear system. One important observation from here is, you realize, okay, from the here to here, there's a big reserve strength. Why we have big reserve strength? Simple. If you have a cantilever beam, if you have a cantilever structure, once you form the press hinge, that's the end of it because it's determinate. But most of the building frames are redundant, highly indeterminate. You require many press hinges to form a yield mechanism. That's the reason why it can keep on climbing, climbing up. Okay? In order to climb up in strength, you also want to make sure that every hinge, press hinge, will serve its purpose to deforming. What is a press hinge? I show you one video. Okay, the one way I explain to my student to visualize, to image the press hinge is Imagine press hinge is nothing but like a rusted hinge. Before you overcome the friction, it will not rotate. Once the moment reaches that friction, which is MP, then it starts to rotate. That's a rust hinge. Okay? You imagine press hinge is nothing but like that. The only difference is both elastic hinge, the real hinge or rust hinge, will can rotate, but the rust hinge has the MP in it while it is rotating. That's the difference between the two. Okay, so once I idealize that, then I call this ultimate strength, I call that as a VY, VY there. Okay, so, and then as I mentioned to you, this is the first press hinge there, but in reality you push up, then there's significant reserve strength. This, 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 the ratio between this one and this one, we call the system over strength. In the terms of code language, that is omega naught that is tabulated in ASC 7. Omega naught. Okay? That is, that is the purpose of it. And I will see how. And because of, because now we idealize this nonlinear, so we more or less can borrow Newmark and the Hall's idea saying we don't have to design that elastic because we're building some ductility. So we should benefit from some ductility reduction. That's the reason why you see that I have a reduction factor there due to ductility, R sub mu, not R. Not, us, not, 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 not all. So here, this figure is very, very important. You see this is system over strength, okay? Due to the redundancy and the ductility. And this is because of ductility that we put in that according to new mark and the whole rule, we can benefit from this reduction. Then now let's see what the code is doing. The ASC7 is doing, okay? The one we have doing. Code gives us this design-based earthquake. Okay, which is the two-thirds of MCE. Code then reduce this by an R factor to the point S. Why? Just for convenience. Just for convenience, such that you don't have to do nonlinear analysis. It's the American way, simple way. We like, to, we like simple, <laughs> right? So your soft software works. That's the main reason, okay? Main reason, because we don't want to do nonlinear analysis, if ever possible. Even though nowadays, sometimes it's unavoidable, you have to do it. Okay, so this R. Now you realize, suppose the ductility, suppose this level, you, you design at this level, okay, that is so-called E in the basic of the central combination, and the, the, you test that the true strength is twice of your design value. So your omega naught is two, for example, it's two. Due to ductility, let's say, the ductility benefits you such that you can reduce this by a factor of four. Then, two times four, that is eight. I just come off the damper. But just give you a feeling, which is not too far away, what the code is intending to do. Intending to do. Okay, the R. Very huge number. Okay, but you have to pay for it. You have to pay for it, okay? You need to make sure you have Redundancy. This is the reason why we have the redundancy requirement. Okay, you want to make sure you have a redundancy and you have to build in ductility. Okay, so in principle, in the very simple format, 
the R factor is nothing but the product of ductility reduction factor, which you build in the ductility detailing, and the system over strength, that is miscellaneous ductility requirement, together with the redundancy, to bring to that level. Okay, now since I've talked about the R and omega naught, I may as well complete the story to talk about the mysterious third factor, C sub D. We the engineer are very happy because we do the elastic analysis there, <coughs> right, so we can compute this. But in reality, the earthquake, earthquake, for earthquake will push your structure to yield in those structure fields and then put your structure to a much higher strength level. Okay, so we know the deformation is not this. And to predict the maximum inelastic deformation, the code gives us this diffraction amplification factor to make our life easy. Okay, and those are factors are empirical and a lot of debate going on. Okay, but uh, this is the basic spirit of those three factors. Now, coming, coming back to the, the capacity design. Now we realize in design office, we have been designing at this level using R. But for capacity design, you have to put this curve in your mind. You realize your structure will climb to here. So you need omega naught. You need to design those members who should remain elastic at this force level, not at this force level. Very, very different. It's very, very different. So this curve is very, very important okay, to understand, to summarize. To summarize, in my class, this is what I, I tell my students, I use my terminology. Design-based earthquake level, without reducing R, this so-called seismic force level one. This is my term terminology, okay? It's not in the code. Okay? Then, reduce by R. This so-called seismic force level two. Okay, we do design there. But keep in mind, keep in mind, the earthquake will drive your structure to this one I call the seismic level three. Okay, the capacity design, you are working at seismic level three. For, cap for the structure fields, you are designing at the seismic level force two. Okay, you cannot mix them, you cannot mix them up. Otherwise, it's in, it's in chaos. It'll be in chaos. Okay, look at the IBC. Okay, we have the basic, I mentioned to you, we have basic uh, seismic and spatial, right? What's so special about it? Whenever you see C spatial, then it means we use E sub M. Whenever you see use E sub M, when they, oh, oh, whenever you see E, you know this is level two. When you do the basic seismic level, basic seismic load combination, you use this E, you should keep in mind, look at the previous figure, previous one, you do level two to design your structure fields. But when you do, when you do capacity design, okay, we have to use so-called spatial seismic load combination, then you use E sub M. So when you see E sub M, okay, you know that is capacity design. And we're dealing with force control element. And E, you use that for, for structure fuse. Okay. In addition to that, the major difference, that, that, that concept, you know, does give some engineers or even some building officials some trouble. You know, understanding sometimes, I have heard some uh, in early days, you know, when this, um, this kind of special load combinations uh, just came out, you know, I have heard in some engineers told, telling me that the building officials want them to use amplified the seismic load, load to design structure fields. For example, the beam in special mode is wrong, it's completely wrong, okay, because the concept is not right. Another thing, you need to know between the level two and the level three. Level two is the elastic analysis. Okay, so at the seismic level two, we use a lot of set basis seismic load combination. We use the elastic analysis to determine internal force, which you have no problem. Okay, we just use the software, no problem. But at the seismic force level three, because of the pressing information, it's an inelastic response anymore. So elastic analysis tool does not work. Does not work. So there's a redistribution, redistribution of the force. So we have to understand that. Example, okay, now let's, for example. In the very, very simple example, if, if I have this one, okay, if I have this one, you know, suppose they are all pinged, pinged connection, and I want this to be the structure fuse, if I do elastic analysis at the level two, then this is nothing but a vertical truss. 
So I have a member, I have a compression there, one in tension, one in compression, and these two forces are equal. Right, this is level two. Elastic analysis does not tell you what happens at the level three. Okay, then in this case, of course, for example, like the beam, you check that as a compression member. Okay, very easy, right? But now you see, the elastic analysis tool is handicapped now. Okay, at the level three. At the level three, this buckles. Then the strength will drop rapidly, as you will see later on, code assumes, it drops to only 30% of the buckling capacity load. So this force, the pushing, the compression force is very small. But this one will be yielded. So this force is very big. Then you do the, ver you, 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 you look at these two, vertical component don't cancel out like this one. So you have very large force pulling down. So beam will see moment. It look horizontal equilibrium. They don't cancel. Okay, you also, okay, the horizontal equilibrium may also be different from this one. But more importantly is the bending because of the vertical pulling force. This way, this phenomenon, you don't see at all from your elastic structure analysis. So you have to keep that in your mind. That's the reason why I say capacity design is challenging. And, uh, you know, uh, and it requires experience and, uh, and a good judgment. And in this particular case, then you have to design that as a beam color because you also have a very large, large moment. Okay, so you have to think beyond elastic response. Okay, that the mentality of elastic analysis mentality, you know, you have to go beyond that for level three. Furthermore, we use the nominal FY to design our structure fields. The earthquake shows no mercy. It just push your structure to yield your member. Whatever the real FY is there, it will develop the true strength. So you have to use the expected material strength, which is covered in the uh, seismic provisions. So we want to use, use expected material strength to see how much force that is developed in the structure fields. There are different methods, okay? There are different methods uh, in the code and in the, ASC in the ASC seminars. I group them into two approaches. Okay, there are different ways of doing things. Okay, I, I group them into two approaches how to deal with this so-called seismic force level three for capacity design. Okay, before I go to the method, okay, this is the expected year strength we should use to find out what is the maximum force that can be developed in the structure fields. Okay, so this is this table there uh, for that purpose. What is the method one? Okay, this is not, um, it's not, it's the, the AIC assignment provision does not say so, okay, but this is just my, my observation, my view, and my classification. The method one can be used nicely when the structure fuse is next to force control element. I will use the example to illustrate this. Okay, and usually you do that, you apply statics at the local level, okay, I will show you with examples, at the local level, not global level, or the system level. When you do this, actually you can throw away that uh, earthquake load that you determine based on the R factor. You throw it away. It's meaningless. That's a level two force. It's meaningless. Don't use that. And this approach represents an upper bound estimate. So if you have a method two, it does not have to go beyond method one uh, force. This is a very simple illustration. Okay, and now it's simple. This is a special constraint of brace frame. Now I have HSS sections. I need to design the weld. I need to design weld, I design bolt, okay? And I want to make sure, uh, you know, that the brace and the tension, it can take that expected yield strength of the member and also under compression, okay? And uh, the, the, the gusset will not buckle. And I have to check the width more section and so I have miscellaneous limit states to, to, to check. Okay, so in this particular case, the structure of the bracing is a structure fuse and the uh, size and provisions has some requirement. It tells what to do, what to do. And uh, those are the things from there. So this is, I call the so-called method one because this one here is supposed to remain elastic other than that 2T requirement, okay? You don't want it to, to have the um, um, 
the yielding in the cassette or, or the damage in the well. So uh, we use, and the, this cassette happens to be right connect to the, the structure fuse. So we use the structure fuse to find out the maximum force it can be developed at the level three and back figure out the force, so called the level two. Uh, so called the method one. This is another well known example. If you have the spatial a V or inverted B bracing, the beam there's some requirement and AIC section 13.48 gives you a requirement. Okay? And again, based on the elastic mentality, these two forces are about equal. Okay, the truss about equal, so the vertical component of tension and compression more or less cancel out each other. But if you look at the, if you look at the level three, then we know code one does us, us, us to assume this will buckle. So code the once it buckles, you use only 30% of the PM buckling capacity. The tensile brace were fully yielded, and we have to use the expected FY to determine the maximum force. So, because this vertical component from this one is much bigger than this one, there's a big force pulling down. So this beam, okay, has to be designed as a beam column because of the tremendous uh, moment induced by that level three, uh, uh, level, level three mechanism. Second example. Okay, now it's different now. The brace are not the structure fuse. Instead, the links are the structure fuse. Link structure fuse. Again, the ASC provisions provide some requirement. Okay, if you read the code there, what it says is pretty like this. You want to, de you want to determine the column. Okay, the code allows us to check the column based on the level three seismic force by ignoring the moment. So our job is to find out what is the maximum actual load. Okay, again, using the elastic analysis tool is misleading, can be, can be misleading. Then we use the, this so-called method one. Because on the lateral load, okay, we have the inflection point at the mid-span of the link. So at the mid-span, if you cut, then you know there's a shear there. Code tells us this link is a structure fuse. Code says you have to assume you have to, based on the expected FY, to find out what is the maximum shear, because link is designed for shear, and to throw in 1.1, that is hardening. And then every link, you assume every link will yield. Okay, then if you take a free body wisely, if ever possible, wisely, and do some uh, simple statics, okay, and by figuring out what is the brace force, you actually can find out by statics what is the actual load in the column. This is, I call it method one. Okay, you do it by, by hand calculation and the, with the basic concept and the, with the wise selection of the free body. Similarly, the EBF design also cover the beam and the bracing design. Okay, so here, assuming the inflection point there, so this is moment diagram. The code tells us, okay, what is the shear in the link, which is the slope of the moment diagram. Okay, depending on your designing for brace or for beam, okay, that the cyclic hardening ratio varies from 1.25 to 1.1. But once you know that, okay, then you know the link length, then you know the moment. Then from simple statics, actually, structure analysis, you can back and figure out what is the force in the brace and what is the force including moment and actual load in the beam outside of the link, then you design based on the AIC, size, based on the AIC specification to make sure they will remain elastic. In either this case and the previous case, one important lesson we need to know in seismic design, don't oversize structure fields, otherwise you pay the price. Because everything else, the braced beam column design, because it's based on capacity design, it's based on how much force that can be delivered, okay? Because earthquake will keep on pushing it. How much force that will be developed in the structure fuse? If you oversize your structure fuse, the force will be larger than brace beam column will suffer, will suffer. So that's another one very important concept. Don't oversize structure fuse. Okay, the last example, RBS. We are known RBS. Okay, we have the beam. We have, the beam, we have the beam there, we have the column, and here this RBS. When we assume the press hinge, it's over there. It's over there. 
Okay, we assume. I'm almost done. I'm also exhausted. <laughs> okay. Okay, you know, assume the inflection point at mid span. Okay, we draw the moment diagram here. I only focus on the seismic. Over gravity, moment diagram is easy to deal with. Just do the superposition, okay? Look at the seismic. Okay, we have the moment diagram. Okay, seismic. Then, at the structure fields, that is RBS, we know what is the pressed second modulus, and we know what is the expected FY, and we also include a, a cyclic hardening factor cyclic hardening factor, then we know what is the probable maximum moment that will be developed at the fuse. Okay, and now, again, when you do this, this is a capacity design. Okay, we're checking the strong current we've been, we are making sure that we're, um, you know, continue to be in the, um, among other things. Um, in this case, you throw away that level two seismic force based on R. Okay, we don't look at that anymore. It's meaningless. Then, once you have this, because the Seismic moment diagram has to be a straight line, then you can extrapolate. You extrapolate to the face of the column. Okay, you look at the, at the AIC, the CPRP, the, A, the, the AIC 358 document, it's a step-by-step -step procedure. If you read that, if you understand this figure, you will understand why we are doing this, why we are doing that. The, that the procedure, the CPRP, the, the, the pre-qualified design procedure, Okay, ask you to compute the moment at the face of the column because over there is where the groove weld is located. And you want to make sure the groove weld is not overloaded. So there's a check. There's a check. It's a capacity design. Okay. Furthermore, okay, we extrapolate the moment to the center line of the column. This is the MPP star. And you look at AIC seismic region, there's a strong column with beam. Strong column with beam. Okay, this represents the demand. The beam is pumping into column. Pumping into column. Okay, the structure fills the beam, the pump into column, and we use that one to, to do the, the strong column with beam design and so forth. Okay, uh, the, level, uh, the, capacity, the method two is I call the lazy method. Whenever you cannot do that, method one, you, can, you don't know how to take the free body, then code says use the level two and provide by omega now. Do you remember that figure? Okay, just amplify by omega, and omega not is given in the code, but we, but we, but we have to be very, very careful. Okay, if you don't apply it properly, then you know it can be dangerous. For example, if you want to fi find out what is the actual force de there, if you use the mentality of the uh, level one, you say, oh, the code says I have to assume this brace once it buckles, it, it's reduced to 0.3 pn. Then I put 0.3, 0.3 here. Then I try to find the force. Probably you're underestimating the force because you have to understand that before it reaches 0.3 N, it has to go through PM first. Okay? Yes. So you have to be very, very careful. <laughs> There's a pitfall, code does not tell you. You have to exercise your judgment. You have to exercise your judgment. Okay, so one way, I understand, you may tell me if I'm wrong, you know, that practice may be different. One way to do is that, you know, you determine the based on R, determine the earthquake law, just amplify everything by omega. You know, to find out what is false there, then, you know, you use the elastic analysis, multiply by omega not. So use method one, method two, you have to be very, very careful. And the thing, another one here, I think the Mr. Saberi in one of his seminar, he used this as an example. Okay, to find out what is the actual load there. If you have to this one, there's no load there. Okay, but you have to keep in mind level three. This will buckle. Okay, this will buckle. And this one, uh, this one is intention. Should you put 0.3 pn here and put the HFY there? and then do the equilibrium, you know, there's a judgment. Okay, you have to exercise your judgment to do it right. Uh, okay, I skipped the last one, and uh, I want to finish, conclude my presentation by repeating, by showing this slide again to conclude my, my presentation on my view of the underlying, underlying concept on seismic design that is nothing but ductility and the capacity design. Thank you.